Hello, hello, dear hearts. Marilyn here with another segment of Wisdom's Way of Learning. I believe that today is probably going to be the last segment of this series. I'm going to be uh, addressing the Unit of Life Notebook Project, the sixth and final um, application of notebook recording that I have been discussing for the last few weeks. I found some things to show you that I... I didn't have a hand um, on the last message that I had wanted to show you. So I had been talking about my son's uh, woodworking projects and I had shown you uh, just a couple of things he had made and and I had mentioned this uh, walking stick and so I wanted to show this to you because he hand carved it and it's just beautiful. This is the handle right here and you can see that there's a delineation right here um, indented, indented line where he made the uh, place for me to just hold on to the stick and then this is the top of the um, of the uh, walking stick and I don't know if you can see that but it's a vine, a flower vine flowers and leaves that goes around the top okay so I think there's the top and it just winds around down the stick right to the handle then there's a break and then there's another portion of carving that just goes to here and then the rest of the stick is plain and then he put a little rubber tip on the bottom. This thing has been um, in rivers. It's been everywhere. Mount Rainier. I just love my walking stick. And then he carved in the handle Christmas 2001. I love you, Mom. John. And that isn't in um, manuscript. Just a very small print. And he was 19 years old when he made that for me. And we were living in Virginia at the time. He just found a sapling out in the woods. All right. So I wanted to show that to you. And then I had a couple other things to show you before we get going. Uh, I've mentioned um, a chain that he had carved. He just wanted to see if he could do it. He took a piece of wood. There it is, right there. And he made this out of it. It's one piece. He carved a chain out of wood. And um, this he made as a surprise for me. Um, there's the stages of it. He did it twice because the first time it didn't turn out right. He was really guessing at how to make those links. And he took process pictures because he knew that I would want to see how he did it. And there he's just getting one of the links freed up. A couple of links freed up there. And I know that there's a glare on those. Um, and so um, he took process pictures and actually he had a sheet that he spread all this out on on the living room floor. Whenever I was gone doing errands, he would pull it out and work on it and then he would put it away and hide it under his bed and I don't remember if he ever told me how long it took but um, it was probably a couple of months he was working on this and he he wrote on the back he didn't carve this one he wrote it on the back to my mom love John Christmas 1998 and so he was oh he was only 16 on this one um, yeah, he was 16 when he did this one. And um, here's the full. Um, here's a little ribbon there. The full picture of the link and the heart. And I thought it was such a neat idea to put a heart in the middle. And when I saw this, so this is 26 and a half inches long. When I saw this, um, it brought to mind a poem 
that I had recited so many times in prayer back in, oh, 1988. So about 10 years earlier, I had been reciting in prayer a poem. My bonds are very, very strong. I never can go free. To holy love I now belong, and he belongs to me. And I just love that um, poem, and I had so, there were several verses to it that I used to quote, and I even put to melody and sang it often. And so that, that gift was especially meaningful, and of course, my John didn't know any of that. And so he was very surprised when I told him about it. It was just one of those, you know, Holy Spirit things that are just very, very special. And then when he was 16, he also um, made a flagpole for our house. We had just moved onto this property. It was in the process of getting developed. And he took a tree pole and, uh, you know, took the bark off and he made a flagpole and and um, did the pulley work and everything. He was 16. Oh, and then he also made an instruction sheet for how to make a flagpole. And we had printed that in the journal at the time. And it's like three, four pages long. Um, he had printed that and then we put it in the journal. And he drew a diagram of the hardware. Um, for that. Let me see where to go. Yeah, here it is. He drew a diagram of how he assembled the hardware. And, you know, there was, he didn't look that up, you know. <laughs> he just figured it out. And then, uh, Catherine, I, I said that she had done some sculpture. And this, these pictures are kind of difficult um, to see, but this is her holding an eagle sculpture that she did. And I'm going to um, show you. Let me see if I can get that eagle sculpture on a base that she made for a friend and she gave to a friend. And um, I'm not sure what that says. It's a scripture from Isaiah. So I want you to see the picture of how she did this. This is a wire base that she had um, assembled the clay around it and then the finished um, painted version of that. It's just really beautiful. And of course, just doing all that from scratch and making it up as you go along, I guess that's what artists do. It's... Um, there's a, a closer up version of the, eh, the angle. You can see the detail more. She painted the feathers and, and everything. So it's just very beautiful. I just wanted you to see a little bit more of what my kids did and um, some of their talents. All right. I do kind of need a break from... Uh, wisdom's way of learning for a while and so I thought maybe I would take a break examine my um, my files and see what I have that I really haven't shared with you before and then go into that later I'm getting some books ready to publish in paper format on Amazon you'll be happy to hear that um, and I also want to probably work on the Wisdom's Way of Learning series to reformat all of that, which is a much bigger deal than it sounds and something that I'm not actually <laughs> eager to get into. But um, I know that it needs to be done and we're getting the Empowered book ready right now. It's actually in the uh, formatted and ready for Amazon. It's getting a book cover designed right now, even as we speak. And I'm excited to finally get that published. And then we're also going to be publishing Love's Actions in a book format. And as God parents you, so parent your children. So we'll have three books that are actually in process of getting 
ready to publish on Amazon so that we have hard copy books that you will be able to give to your friends. And we'll get that those passed around, I think, much um, more likely passed around than just a digital version does. All right, so that's where we're at with um, our publishing efforts. And if you have any questions whatsoever, or if you have anything in particular that you would like me to cover more of, I would truly like to know it. And you can post that right here or um, under the video in YouTube, on YouTube or wherever that you find this video, you can post your requests. Uh, you could send an email to admin or to Marilyn Houschel at MarilynHouschel.com. You can send an email there or to the admin at MarilynHouschel.com. Um, however you find to send a message other than I really don't like private messages from Facebook. I don't like to get on the uh, messenger and I don't get on Facebook hardly ever except to do these videos and um, check on particular things that uh, with people that I am communicating with regularly. But other than that, I'm not getting on Facebook. So please send messages uh, in the ways that I'm asking you to. But I would really like to hear from you. And um, let me know um, if there's anything in particular that you would really like for me to cover. I'm not in your life, so I can't see what your particular needs are. I know that we've covered a lot, a lot of material in this series. And... And honestly, I think it would be worth it for you to go back and review it uh, in the context of the whole picture of everything that we have been covering and see where maybe um, there might be a gap in your understanding that you would like me to address a little better. All right, so I would appreciate that. And then um, I'm going to talk today about the Unit of Life Notebook Project. And of course, you're all familiar with my daughter's bird book. And that was the book that, um, that inspired this, um, this project, one of the applications of the notebook method. And um, I believe that it is a great culmination uh, project for a period of avid um, childhood learning to be uh, produced in a in a product form uh, demonstrating some of the things a child knows and has been learning and it's great for ages 14 to 18 years old um, uh, Catherine's bird book is a model for this teaching and I have that right here and that of course was the three three inch binder of 90 pages originally 90 pages and i've had several stories added to it since then in fact i had written that out and i wonder where i put that note well and i had wanted so much to be able to just show you page to page of this book and i just am not able to it's just a little much but here is a two-page spread and there's a story that accompanies that particular bird which is the pigeon and there was pigeon in the picnic that Catherine wrote on that one um, here's one called Bruno and this one is about a chicken and and uh, and Domino and the Great Grey story is also in here. Two chicken stories. And then there's a peafowl page. And um, information about peafowl. And, and there's some more pages just on peacocks simply because we had peacocks. And so there's more pictures and more stories and poems that Catherine wrote 
about peacocks and and of course um, the feathers and these are ac the actual feathers this, these are not color copies these are the actual feathers actual pictures from a real period of time when we were um, we had peacocks and this is a poem that Catherine wrote about Big Bird who was killed and one of our favorite birds so I'm going to go into this a little bit more here and talk about the nature of all this and get going with it. Oh my, that's heavy. Let me see, where's the book? And so all, all of, all of the uh, notebook records, all six of them, or all the first five notebook records that we talked about, and projects, collections, composition, notebooks for the copy work and handwriting practice, um, um, uh, collections of letters and other and stories and other types of writing that children do. Uh, so all of these notebooks, eventually, because of the the um, sheer amount of writing that children begin to do because they're enjoying working on their own life. Um, they will lead the, the student to a larger project. That's what happened with Catherine. Eventually he did with John, but he was four years younger than Catherine. And so he didn't actually um, do a larger notebook until he was 17. Um, he wasn't actually ready to do one sooner than that. And that's why I put the age bracket here, 14 to 18 years old. It depends on when they learn to read, write, how fluent they are, how much they enjoy reading and writing. Um, John wasn't bent the same way as Catherine. He was bent toward more projects, although Catherine was very project-oriented too, but she also loved to write. And so that was in her favor. For John, he never shied away from writing once he had that freedom from the fear of having to come up with something to say. Once he understood that, he never shied away from writing again, but because he wasn't an avid reader and writer, um, he just didn't produce as much along those lines. But like I just showed you, he wrote a five-page instruction sheet by hand on how to make a flagpole. And so there's there's um, skills in that that aren't just about writing. You're having to break down the steps of how to do something to show someone else how to do. So it's a little bit more detailed work than just writing some kind of fiction story, um, a small fiction story. You can make that up as you go along. You don't have to uh, be as detailed in your expression as as if you're as when you're actually trying to teach something. And so he actually did develop some skills doing that. And and so I wanted to um, make it clear that it doesn't really matter um, when a student decides that he's ready for such a project. Um, I really wanted my kids to have a final project. It didn't matter for me, it didn't matter to me um, what that project content consisted of because I was way more concerned about the skills of learning than about the content. Because I knew by then that content was very easily acquired. and which I came to learn that it was that's absolutely true. My children were very quick to learn and obtain content and subject matter for themselves. They, they had come to love learning and there was just no nothing stopping them as far as subject matter and a very broad range of subject matter they were interested in. So that just isn't an issue 
What is the issue? It's the character formation. You want to be sure you are forming character in your children. The learning tools and the development of them affords much opportunity for your children to develop character on a day-to-day -day basis. And so you want your wisdom applied there, moms. That's where you want your wisdom applied. So this bird book is a more thorough presentation and documentation of a specific area of interest that Catherine had been actively specializing in over a substantial period of time. And in fact, for her, I'm, be, I'm remembering that it was actually eight years of collecting, um, collecting feathers. Yeah. You see the contents of it. I really want you to hear about the contents of it. Because, so you can see the scope of not only the project itself, but also of Catherine's prior long-term delight directed learning process that produced it. It'll also help you to understand my evaluation of this project. So there were 233 feathers representing 32 species of birds. There were 34 illustrations drawn and colored by Catherine, 37 snapshots. There were bird photographs scattered throughout the book, and six pages are devoted to the documentation of the different kinds of birds' nests from her nature collection. Of course, these are, this is a photo documentation of the bird nests that we still have on display in the nature collection. Um, we took pictures of each of the 11 nests, especially for mounting in the book. Mo most of them are identified. And then there's one photo taken of the bird's eggs collection. And these were found out of season and had been abandoned. And Catherine drew, drew a vertical ruler down the center of the oversized piece of paper and lined up the six eggs horizontally from the largest to the smallest, and each is identified. Also included was a special four-page photo section on bird pellets that Catherine's brother John contributed since this is his area of interest. A series of photos shows John in the process of dissecting bird pellets and cleaning, sorting, and identifying the bone fragments contained in the pellets. There are 30 data cards containing species name, complete description of the male, complete description of the female species, description of the young and similar species. And then of course the compositions. There's, there were five stories that Catherine wrote and a one page spiritual metaphor, two short poems and two illustrated two page instruction sheets. Um, since then there was an additional instruction sheet um, two-page instructions sheet having to do with birds. And there, uh, be, eventually there were six more stories added to this book. And this was before she was uh, 17, that she added these for, from between the age of 15 to 17, added more pages to the book. There were 17 brief photo captions describing various encounters with birds. There were 120 feather data captions where she identified the part of the body each feather came from, the wings, shoulder, breast, tail, neck, belly, down, crown, back, throat, or face. There were 12 section contents pages and a two page glossary. And so these content pages were the title pages for each section of the book. There was a two page glossary with 12 words commonly used in the book and four scriptures. And so that was quite extensive. There were 11 sections just to accommodate um, the different um, categories in the book. And then the, the actual title page in the beginning. 
so um, uh, we used um, cardstock in a subdued color as a backdrop to complement the feature, the feathers. Um, and they're all in protective plastic sleeves, which open at the top and uh, have a three hole uh, punched for placing in notebook binder. And then in the cover, the um, picture that I showed you is a picture of a real bird, big bird, that that was a pet and that we blew up to fit the notebook. So you see, it's quite um, extensive. And I want you to know that the only thing that I did, once I helped her design, because I had to, she had to gather up what she had before we could design the book. I didn't know what she had. She'd been collecting feathers for so long in envelopes. And once she got everything gathered up and categorized according to the type of bird it was, um, we made an outline for what, for what to how the book was going to look. And the only thing that I did was make these um, little paper frames to go around the pictures so that Catherine would have, um, you know, a little frame to set off her, um, here's another one. They're all different colors depending on the bird. You can see that. I just made those on the computer um, just a little frame and cut those out. But Catherine did all the other work of this book. And here's a flicker, which is, I think it's just beautiful feathers. Um, and so there's exotic birds, and those are from people who had pets, and also feathers from, um, that she found, um, either in a pet store or at the zoo. <laughs> There's, I think, three exotic birds in that book. But for the most part, it's um, domestic birds. Let me see if I have a... Yeah, songbirds. There are 12 songbirds, three game birds, four domestic birds, four birds of prey, two water birds, three other birds, oh, four exotic birds, Two poems and songs, six pages of bird nests and eggs, four pages of bird pellets, six pages of instruction sheets. Um, all right, so that's quite an extensive project. And the construction process, I, I want to make a point of this. The construction process actually included all four of the learning model categories where Catherine was collecting, recording, um, making projects, and studying and reading. And so in the collecting, she, she had collected feathers, she was getting them all organized, and then the data about the feathers she was collecting, uh, the photos and the scripture. So there's all that collecting going on. And collecting is, is a part of research. Then the recording, she did the contents, the title pages, the glossary, the identification of the bird data, the labeling captions, the compositions that are included in the book. This was a five month project. Okay, to finish it at 90 pages. And over the following two years, she added um, six more stories and another instruction sheet. But the initial uh, finished uh, five month finished prod project was uh, 90 pages. And then the projects were the book construction, the planning, the page design, the arrangement, the illustrations, the photography. Then the study and reading, five Bible versions. Catherine wanted to see what every Bible version we had in the house um, said about the scriptures that she found in the concordance and the topical Bible. 
and then also the identification books and other nature reference books and she discovered her favorite version of the bible during this um during this study and all the activity of putting the book together um i felt like what happened with Catherine rather than read this um when she started the, the long-term learning process, she was six years old, collecting and sorting feathers for storage, okay? And just in envelopes. And then the projects began when she was 12. Um, projects for um, feeding birds um, and, and projects with feathers. She was doing lots of different projects with feathers. I think the feeding birds was happening much before that. And then the this book project began at 14. So you can see that there's this long-term process of, of just really enjoying um, an area of interest. And, and in that um, enjoyment uh, when a child truly enjoys an area of interest, they they end up wanting to find out more about it. And so understand that, um, ladies, they want to learn more about it. And so you don't want to underestimate the, um, the power of an interest to engage a child in learning and all the activities that... Um, that come into play when a child pursues avidly an area of interest because this is what you're wanting them to do you're wanting them to pursue avidly an area of interest and to learn and consume and then to produce because you can't produce something you haven't first consumed so let them consume and consume and they will begin producing informally on their own it's kind of a natural, um, a natural outflow. Um, people, human beings were made to produce and children are no exception to that. If you haven't squashed their love of learning, that is, they're going to want to produce as well. And they want to reproduce what they recognize from nature or that has already been created by man. They like to reproduce. And you can see that in any child's play. They want to make real food. They want to do real food with play food when they're really tiny, you know, when they're toddlers. They want to do real food. Um, we just had a birthday party for one of the grandsons and he was so excited when he opened a present and it was real food that he gets to make. It was a food kit um, for children and he gets to make real food. He got so excited, real food, because he's passed the, the plane with the plastic food. He's past that stage. He wants to do the real thing now. You see, don't know where that's going to go, but you know, they're little and they have lots of exploring to do. So um, the, the unit of life uh, notebook or project uh, should be reflecting a unit of your child's life. It doesn't reflect everything they know about everything. It doesn't have to. It just needs to reflect something they've had a passion for so that their learning tools are finally honed, okay? And then that um, project, actually that activity of putting something like that together prepares them for more formal studies as they get older. And so Catherine, by the time she finished this book, she had just turned 15 and she wanted to do more. And this is where um, uh, the realism hit her hard. She kept wanting to do more and more notebooks and putting everything she knew in notebooks, which is extremely unrealistic. But she had to come to that on her own. 
Okay, she just had to come to that on her own. And so I'm going to show you the next thing that she did was her horse book. And it's not nearly as fat. It's just the one inch binder. I think that's one inch or one and a quarter inch. I don't know what how wide that is. It's just a normal size notebook binder. And because she was really into horses and wanting to... Uh, have a horse, which she didn't get until she was about 19. And I'd shown you some of the pages from this horse. She has a section on introducing the horse. And so she has all the the different um, um, identification markings of a horse. And of course, all of this was was her own work she wanted to do for a notebook and I was glad that she wanted to do this because she was proving an interest before we invested in a very expensive um, hobby and so um, this is just the studying of horses and she has a section on foals uh, drawings and their mommies and a section on um, action horses, horses in action. I really like this this little drawing. I think it's really cute. Horses in action, and um, on she has a section on horses' heads, horse breeds, and famous horses, and a section on tack. And then she also has um, some of her own study at the back, um, a listing of all the things that she would need to be able to have a horse. And um, her savings plan is at the back. Um, what else? Oh, different places to send for information where she wrote letters and sent for information and then she has a chart checking it off when she received it so just lots of plans are in that book and when she was finished with that and she did that in that same summer after the bird book was finished um she wanted to do um let's see where is it a spider web notebook and I don't think I've got that one in front of me here. Let me see. Oh, I have the, the sample one here from our displays. Amazing spider web um, book. And this is an actual drawing she did and information on it. And this is an actual spider web because she learned how to collect them. And I don't know how many, and how to preserve a spider web. She did an instruction sheet on that, how to preserve a spider web, which I think is just fascinating. I've never seen anybody do that before. So she was 15 when she did this and the book only has 20 pages in it. It has 10 real preserved spider webs. And they're identified with color illustrations and includes the instruction sheet on how to collect and, and preserve. So that's a small book and she just did it that summer, never did it again. It was just a fun thing that she wanted to do. Um, when she was 16, she wanted to do a butterfly book. She had collected butterflies her whole life, since she was probably four. And I want to show you a picture here of, of butterflies that have been were mounted for preservation. And that was just one collection. <laughs> one collection there. And I told her at the time, you know, I don't think you're going to be able to make a book on butterflies. And um, because she was getting older and she needed to work and she needed to do move her life forward more in different ways. She didn't need to be living in these notebooks. And, and this is 
her when she was 12 or I think 12 or 13 um, with her nat. And so she went as far as how to mount butterflies for collecting an instruction sheet. And she did one fritillary, which is a male and a female, right here. And the caterpillar and the um, drawing of the chrysalis. And she did Texas butterflies and moths because we were living in Texas at the time. And so she, she colored those. Not butterflies that we have. She did manage to get a monarch, which I have on my wall in the other room. She got a monarch butterfly from Texas. And she did a little book on Texas, but she only got as far as the artwork. Um, because it was we were moving constantly back then. And we started moving, and she... Um, wanted to get to know Texas and so she studied Texas and lived in Texas for a year and um, so she learned that much about Texas other than she learned she didn't want to live there. <laughs> we missed the Northwest so that was the extent oh no there's some birds she did Texas birds and yeah, those are her drawings with artist's colored pencils. She did Texas reptiles and amphibians. Um, yeah, she's an artist. <laughs> she's an artist. So that's what she did. Um, uh, she did a, when we moved to Virginia, she made a turtle book, um, notebook. Um, I don't have that. She has that. Um, but that was all, and I I told her, you can't put your whole life in a notebook. And she was just having so much fun doing it, you see. John didn't care about making another book. I'm going to show you his. Where is it? He made one um, of the larger notebooks, and this is his Jetman movie. He did three um, Jetman movies, and... He has the, some of the artwork from back then. They didn't have the, you know, it was hard to do. It was really hard to make movies, okay? It wasn't nearly as easy as it is today. And a ton, ton of work uh, because everything was analog. And so he has these pages where he filmed the, the characters. And then he has the storyboard pages of the storyboard. And this is uh, three, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Thirteen. So there are 15 pages of the storyboard, and this is just for one of the movies, and then he has pictures at the back where he's writing about the characters, and John played all six characters in the movie, <laughs> all six characters in here. He made a dummy. Um, let me see, where is it? There it is. He made a dummy to wear his clothes. To um, and he made it to you know I better show that to you better. Made it look um, with hinges and the arms and legs and has his clothes on so he could throw the dummy. He also flew through the sky from the on a pulley rigged up from the roof of the house um, over to somewhere else, a tree or something, and um, flew the dummy across the the sky. 
anyway, so that's his work. That's what he did when he was 17. And he didn't make another notebook. I didn't expect him to. Um, I was happy that he was wanting to do that that much. Um, he could have done that for all of his movies. It doesn't matter. Um, he knows how to do things. You know, he knows how to do put a book together just like Catherine. He knows how to use all the learning tools. Um, he knows how to do everything he wants to do. And, you know, as, as you know, you know, he built his own cabin and he's, um, he reads and he studies and he, he researches and does all the things that life requires of us and he does them well and so does Catherine and I'm very proud of both of them. I just wanted you to see the extent of what a notebook project could do. Um, there's other examples I just want to give you a big rundown list like music, dance, art, nature, history, war, weapons, communication, transportation, electronics, computers, mechanics, health, physics, construction, culinary arts, sewing, weaving, sports, gardening, and so on. And book projects can require varying lengths of time to complete, depending upon the extent to which a student has been involved with a topic of interest. Um, I would say you don't want something like that to take much more than the five months it took Catherine to do the bird book. They have to really want to live in that. And um, you could do uh, break down nature project books down into themes like Catherine's bird book was a feather collection. There could be a flower book. In fact, Catherine started that as well because she collected pressed flowers that she used for making gifts. Um, there could be geography, where you're exploring your own home state with family trips. There's a place to begin. Um, all the stuff of a child's life can be gathered up for examination. It could be um, multiple different types of projects, like John's first projects book that I had showed you when he was 10. Only as an older child with more information about, and they're probably more sophisticated projects by then, you see, but he was seven to 10, and so his projects weren't sophisticated, but maybe um, a child, a boy at the age of 14 just loves lots of projects, and he, he's developed his skills, and he produces a lot. John did a lot of different woodworking projects that could have gone into a notebook, but we didn't do that. You see, he wanted to do a Chapman notebook. So it doesn't matter what the content is, as long as it reflects their life and their interests, okay? And so you have applied skills of writing and talents like drawing and painting and photography, stitchery even. And those are just a few of the mediums. Um, a, ki a kid who likes to paint all sorts of mediums of painting, like acrylics and watercolors and oils, um, things like that. Uh, those could go in a notebook. Um, so you get the idea, but I wanted to show you, go back. I'm going to compare this project to the vital signs of learning. Um, in Catherine's example, she took delight in nature as delight directed, and she actively pursued the feeding and identification of birds for many years, so that's valuably active, and then productively created her own bird feeders, re, uh, instruction sheets, and repeated this process on a regular basis. Um, she made her own nature identification books, coloring books with captions, things like that when she was little. Um, now they weren't sophisticated polished products until she was, you know, a little older. She was able to type and make things look better by then. Um, then uh, she was motivated and focused her energies in these learning pursuits and her study was individual, individuality and life relational. So there's seven vital signs. You see it touched her life where we lived. And so all of these vital signs were completely um, 
in, she was completely engaged in learning and demonstrated the vital signs of learning while she was going through all of the play and research, the reading, the projects, the recording, all of the activities that you find kids doing when they want to learn something, right? So, um, I think that's about it. Um, so the project is a true outgrowth of your child's life of learning. And you know what was ha happening with Catherine is that she just loved doing it. Um, I made a, at that time, my kids had only ever done an hour or less of table time a day. And by the time she was 14 and, and uh, able to do more, I had up to two hours. And it's just, you know, a minimum of two hours a day. Um, four days a week to work on it. That would be her table time. And she got into it and she wanted to do more. And she asked me, is it okay if I work on this on the weekend? She just, it was like, she was hoping I would say yes. You can work on as much as you want to. And so I think it would have taken a lot longer to finish had she not wanted to do that. And so she ended up spending much more time on it over the weekends. I didn't want her to spend much more time on it during the weekdays because I had other things I wanted them to be doing. I wanted a well-rounded learning experience. I, I didn't want them just marathoning. I wanted my kids to learn how to do real life, even uh, through the intensity of larger projects. <laughs> we had plenty of that going on in our life, over the years they grew up in that because we had a book making business and mail order business and I still and all the writing that I needed to do for the journal I still spent lots of quality time with my kids every single day and I I don't want them ever to get into the mode of not paying attention to their own children, you see, where they're just marathoning projects. I see them doing that today, is that they take time, go for a walk with the kids, um, do other things, um, have the breaks that you need to have, even when you're under a lot of pressure to get a project completed. And yet they don't wanna miss out on life, you see? You don't wanna miss out on life, and so, um, when children are in school, they're missing out on a lot of life. Um, you don't want them to miss out on life. And so I would suggest not more than two hours a day, no matter how old they are, until they're getting ready to go to college and they need to do something and there's a deadline to it. You know, teach them about deadlines and let them grow into that. But while they're growing up, you don't, you don't need to be marathoning projects. And that's another reason why I would have, allow my kids to have a table set up, a craft table. If they had a project that was going to take a lot longer than just that day's productive free time, because they had like a four hour period of productive free time each day. Um, if it was going to take longer than that, I let them set it up and set it aside for the next day. I didn't expect them to marathon it and then skip everything else that was important for our life that day. You see, um, unless there's a deadline. You see, if there's a deadline, that's different. But in most of the things when kids are growing up, there are no deadlines. And, um, you know, you know how that is. You can see that yourself. <clears throat> So, um, that was that. So you're fostering both a delight in learning and the ability with which to learn, right? And I don't have anything else that I really want to say about this. Unless somebody has questions, I would really like to know if you have questions. Um, 
think just um, seeing how it all came down, um, you can see how fruitful, um, you can see how fruitful the lifestyle of learning in my children's lives has been. And which can also be very fruitful for your children as well. But remember to love your children and know them and don't put undue pressure on them because they actually do want to learn. It's just that if they've been turned off, if they've been pressured wrongly, if they've been... Um, now I have always pressed gently my children forward, you know, encouraging them. It's called encouragement to stretch themselves and and to continue to move their life forward when they were younger. I encouraged them that way. I don't have to do that today, but but I did. You know, when you're raising your children, you encourage them and you you give them learning successes so that um, they feel confident to tackle the weak areas of their life. And you want to help them round that out so that they're overcoming weaknesses or deficits or gaps in their development. Because when we think about education, think about personal development. Because that's where education lies. It's Education is expressed in personal development. And so... So um, guide your children's personal development of the learning tools because then you're also guiding their character development, right? So don't forget those things, ladies. And so I know I didn't read through all of this, but I think that we've covered so much of it in previous messages that I would be, it would be redundant to simply read through um, any more of this. All right, so encourage your children, they're learning. Thank you, Lord. I just pray that, that if there's a controlling spirit in your home, that, that you begin to see it, that the Lord exposes it to you. If there's a controlling spirit, if there's a spirit of fear in your home, that you are serving instead of serving God and your children. I pray that you see that so that those spirits are not what is driving your life and driving your children's lives because they will know. Children will know and they will resist being controlled and they will resist um, uh, wrong, the wrong kind of pressure, carnal pressure. They will resist it. And then you won't have their hearts. So this process for you, mom, is really about your growth. It's about your surrender. It's about you receiving from the Lord what you need from him so that you are not putting ungodly pressure on your dear children. You want godly pressure on your children. And that is completely different from ungodly pressure. So look at the fruit. The fruit is right in front of you. How are your children responding to you? If there's a, a resistance of any kind, pay attention to that. What is inside of you that they are experiencing from you? You might even ask an older child, ask the older children, what is it they are experiencing from you? And then take that to the Lord. Because God wants to help you surrender your life to become completely dependent upon him to lead you in the way that you should be leading your children. You see, um, there isn't anything better than being spirit-led. God knows what your children need, and he knows what they will respond to in a very positive way. He knows they have need of personal development. He knows all of the things that you have concerns about. And you have many legitimate concerns, but you may have some that aren't so legitimate. You may have some fears that are rooted in just unknown. Well, faith is all about the unknown. Or you may have fears rooted in comparison 
to the culture. Don't compare yourself to culture. Raise a standard in your home. Cultures failed miserably. There's just too much failure there for you to be even concerned about any of it. You don't know what your kids are going to grow up to be or want to do. Let them decide that. And when they decide that they want to do something and jump through the hoops of a system in order to do it, they'll want to do that and they'll figure it out and you will help them figure that out how to do it. But it doesn't take a whole lifetime to prepare for college. What, what takes a lifetime to prepare for is life. Life requires preparation. Character requires formation, and that takes time. So don't forfeit your care, children's character formation for the sake of some uh, false idea or some unknown future that you don't even know is going to happen. All right, prepare your children with character because that prepares them for life. And if they have character, they'll be able to get everything else. Don't forget that, dear hearts. It's the most important thing that you will ever do in your life is get character formed in your children. It's the most rewarding thing you will ever do and the very most important. And it's God's will for you. He's given it to parents. Go read Deuteronomy 6 and examine the words of that passage. He says, and, and these words shall be first in your own minds and hearts, and then you shall teach them diligently and impress them upon the minds and hearts of your children. Yes, thank you, Lord. And so remember the meaning of those words, impress. God wants you to impress and diligently his words of truth on the hearts of your children. And those are relational truths, to love them with their whole heart. You can't help them to do that if, they, if you don't even have their heart. You see, you can't help them to do that, dear hearts, you know that. So you need to have their hearts and recognize when you may be uh, carnally pressuring them the wrong way so that you can pull back and make happy children who love to learn because that is what they were born to do. They were born to learn and to love learning and to love life that God, the life that God has given them. And so help them to go into that place by you retreating back into your proper place and then leading them with the wisdom of God as a parent and parent your children as God has been parenting and wants to continue to parent you to your heart. All right, well, I'm going to end there and let you go. And this was the final video of Wisdom's Way of Learning series. I do want to hear from you. Please post notes under the video and let me know if there's anything in particular you would like me to address. And I may come back on for a follow-up um, Q&A. Um, somewhere over the next few weeks, I'm going to be examining my messages and my work to see where I can go from here. I'm not quite sure yet where I'm going to go from here. Be watching for our new books. Empowered will be the first. And then as God parents you, so parent your children. And also Love's Actions will also be a book. And these will be in print on Amazon. And I will let you know give you an announcement when this is ready to go. It's in the works right now, so it'll be really soon. Okay, God loves you. I love you. Go love on those precious kiddos of yours. They are very, very dear to the Lord. Bye-bye, ladies.